Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Sophia Arend, and I am a senior analyst at the Global Blockchain Business Council. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second installment of the GBBC Virtual Members Forum with GBBC member Blockchain Technology Partners and Quantum Materials Corporation. For the coming months, the GBBC will be hosting bi-weekly webinars to showcase the innovative work of our members around the world. Today, we are, do are joined by Duncan Johnston-Watt, founder and CEO of Blockchain Technology Partners, and Jay Williams, Chief Technology Officer at Quantum Materials Corporation, for a presentation and audience Q&A on their innovative platform utilizing blockchain, cloud, and nanotechnology to tackle the $1.8 trillion criminal counterfeit industry. Duncan is a regular keynote speaker, serial entrepreneur, and technology pioneer with over 30 years experience in the software industry. His latest venture is Blockchain Technology Partners, a leading enterprise blockchain company offering Sextant for Hyperledger Sawtooth and Sextant for Daml. Prior to this, he founded CloudSource Corporation, creator of the Apache Brooklyn Open Source Project, serving as its CEO for nine years. Duncan was also founder and CTO of Autonomic Computing Pioneer, Enigmatic Corporation, which was sold to iWave and subsequently acquired by EMC. Duncan holds a Master's of Science in Computation from Oxford University. Our second guest, Jay Williams, is CTO of Quantum Materials Corporation and has been a Chief Technology Officer and consultant to many Fortune 500 companies. He is a highly sought after enterprise systems architect and problem solver and has advised a number of high profile technology companies on their products. Widely respected by his peers, he has influenced many pivotal technology consortia and industry steering groups. We welcome your questions at any point during today's webinar. We kindly ask that you submit the questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will anonymize your questions when we pose them to the presenters. And without further ado, I'd like to hand things off to Duncan and Jay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia. Um, so uh, delighted to be able to present uh, to you today. And uh, we have a special guest, Jay Williams from QMC. So he's going to set the scene. Over to you, Jay. Howdy, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I see there's still a few people joining, so uh, uh, I, I will not read our blue sky statement to, uh, to, uh, to uh, take more time, but uh, let's dive straight into the first slide. So today we're going to talk about counterfeiting, um, and we're going to talk about, you know, all the things related to that, which have to do with identity, authentication, authorization, um, and really how, how do you deal with, you know, the fact that uh, there's at least one counterfeit version of probably everything in your house <laughs> uh, and everything that we do. This also, you know, gets into a lot of other areas, which we're not going to cover today. Um, before we also get started, I just want to make a note. Uh, many people might have noticed our press release around things going on with uh, COVID-19 and some of the stuff that we're doing. We will not be addressing any of that from a QMC perspective today, uh, but we do have another webinar on Monday with the uh, Atlantic Council, which, uh, which we'll be talking about that in a larger forum. So you can go to our website to, to find out about that. I know several people had pinged me before the, before the show this morning uh, asking about that. So when we think about how goods are counterfeited, um, usually, you know, they're replicated in a material way. Um, and the, the way that they do that is to get really close to how they are in the physical world. And because we've never had a way to, to differentiate physically uh, things, it's been very challenging. Most of the, most of the, the kind of war on counterfeiting uh, is done through social means in the sense of people infiltrate uh, groups of people or they attempt to um, find the counterfeits and compare them to the real one and then track them back to their source. So next slide. So, you know, um, the biggest part of the problem, especially with the things that people have been doing today to track these kind of things, is that there's never been a way to link the physical and the digital worlds together. Um, almost all supply chain software works, you know, literally uh, through uh, some form of serial number that's imprinted onto a device. Uh, many other things to, to link to that serial number have been created. Uh, you know, if you think about it in terms of things like uh, UPCs or QR codes, those are stickers for the most part. They're, they're, they're bound onto things. There's a lot of ways 
to dupe those those kinds of uh, structures. Um, I spent a lot of time. I was one of the first RFID uh, developers that worked with uh, with different technologies to implement RFID for everything from you know liquor to cars to to everything else. And I, I'm one of the challenges, of course, with them is they're very expensive um, and they require a lot of maintenance. I mean, when you've got a smart tag, you have to you have to maintain that smart tag. And they have batteries and they have life cycles and they have all kinds of things. And while in the last you know uh, 15 years, you know, we've made a lot of strides around those things. They, they're still, uh, you have to have a whole separate se uh, system to manage um, that whole entire RFID process and, and how you do things. And um, that makes it very challenging. And so um, as we were working on things, and I'll talk a little bit about dots in a minute, um, you know, we started thinking about how do we, how do we, um, connect the physical and the digital together. Um, this happens, you know, and we're gonna, we're here obviously talking about the blockchain and those kind of things. This applies to many of the kinds of things that we do. Today, for example, digital tokens, if you think about Bitcoin or you think about any of the cryptocurrencies out there, one of the biggest challenges is what? Managing your wallet, right? Because you have to have some form of physical wallet, some form of physicality um, to be used with that digital world to secure it effectively. Right, you cannot secure everything in the digital world without having something that exists in the physical world. Well, in in supply chains and the material world, it's the opposite, of course. Right, we want to figure out a way to use digital things to be able to secure physical things, but we still have to have that link into into the physical world. So, what's that link? Quantum dots. Um, Many of you, you know, may have heard of nanotechnology, uh, but not understand exactly what it is. Nanotechnology is a very, very broad word, uh, just like the internet is a very, very broad word. There are a lot of things that fall under, under the word nanotechnology. What it really means is it's pretty small, uh, or sometimes really, really small. Um, really, quantum dots are just are just crystals. They're artificial crystals that that we make in the lab. Uh, and part of part of uh, QMC's, you know, claim to fame, our speciality is uh, is we have a lot of patents around uh, our flow reactor, which allows us to make dots in a very different way than say the quantum dots that are in your uh, Samsung television are made, or things like that. They're made typically through a batch process, which is arduous and slow, and frankly not very accurate for the most part. You can't actually control down to um, a specific, uh, you know, a nanometer when you produce. The those dots. Um, as you can see from the picture here, uh, they're very colorful and they're colorful because they live, uh, you know, on a particular spectrum and because they can manage that spectrum and we can, we can, we can embed them in a certain spectrum, they have a spectrum of uh, display, right? We can actually um, control the emission of photons and electrons when you excite them with a particular energy source, whether that's something like a UV light uh, or IR light or uh, um, electrical uh, pulses that you can actually use to, to, uh, to excite um, those crystals in there. And for the most part, you see them already. They're, they're in some phones, they're in some TVs, they're in various and sundry places. And they're, they're basically um, you know, combined together, millions of them in a, in a particular uh, area to, to alter, enhance, or change um, the, the type of light that gets emitted. They can also store energy um, you know, for things like batteries. Next slide, There's a question from Richard, um, wondering whether they can be embedded in liquids. Um, yes. Yeah, so one of the things that's interesting is they're they're literally artificial molecules. So pretty much any substance um, they can be in. You know, one thing people ask me all the time is, you know, um, you know, can we eat them? Right? Can we ingest them? Can we put them in a human? Can we put them in an animal? You know, are they organic? What can we do with them? The answer is quantum dots are actually made from all of the same you know things that exist in the world today: silicon, gold, silver, uh, and you know toxic related things. So originally, the dots were made from cadmium. Uh, you know, there there are many you know toxic kinds of things. Why? Because those are more radioactive. They they have more you know ability to radiate. Uh, because they're, they're stronger energy sources. Of course, we don't want to eat any of those and we don't want to take any of those inside of us. But a as we've, uh, you know, uh, progressed in our technology, um, we've been able to create non-toxic 
uh, dots that can be used in lots of things and be near humans. Um, you know, we currently have a project uh, where we're, we're going through a level of toxicology that uh, will result in FDA certified, you know, kinds of things um, that will allow us to, to use them directly with humans. Uh, you may have read, several people have been working on using them to do things like uh, put uh, vaccines via microneedles inside of the outer part of your uh, uh, epidermis. When I say vaccines, I mean vaccine records. Uh, in other words, not only delivering the vaccine, but delivering the fact that the, you had the vaccine uh, into a, into a uh, you know, epidermal tattoo, if you will, uh, that's only seeable under UV or IR light, in that case IR. Um, but, uh, you know, there, so there, there, are, you know, lots and lots of things that we can put them in. One of our projects is working, um, you know, with, um, folks that make oil, because one of the things, and when I say that, I mean car motor oil, and uh, uh, basically people uh, obviously in different countries would like uh, access to good oil, but instead they get bad oil because people unscrew the cap, pour out the good oil and sell it on a market somewhere else and then refill it with substandard oil in the same container that looks like a branded version for someone else. And then they sell it as that branded version and people use it in their vehicles and it degrades their vehicles. So, you know, very challenging. Yes, so liquids is true. Inks, for example, we have an ink version that does that. I'll talk a little bit about our signatures and things in a minute. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, one of the things that's different from us is that we have our flow reactors, which allow us to produce those. One of our flow reactors can produce about 2 million metric tons of dots a year. Um, and so that, that makes it, uh, you know, uh, much more inexpensive to produce these and to, uh, to deliver these. Um, so, uh, obviously including liquids, I even got it on the slide. I'm amazed. So, uh, the most important thing though, that we've added to this is not only the ability to make the dots, uh, it's the ability to integrate those together with a digital token. And so the QDX platform's job is to basically take a signature because we have a patented way that we can actually combine multiple dots together to make an actual signature um, that works similar to an IP address so that we can assign that to an actual object, uh, actually um, either through different kinds of technologies, embed that signature or attach that signature based upon the molecular structure of the dots, to the actual object and then tie that to an actual digital token. I think most everybody can figure out why that's valuable because then we can use that digital token to tie it to say the batch ID of the manufacturer so that then we can track that particular physical object through the supply chain. And by using what we call an authenticator, which is simply a mobile device that, that can read uh, IR or UV uh, or a warehouse management system reader, standard readers that everybody use today that can read UV, um, you can actually read that signature off of that object as it moves through the supply chain. It can actually also work as you go into retail. So for example, in the retail world, um, once somebody takes that retail product, say their Gucci purse or uh, a very expensive watch or anything else out into the world, um, they can actually prove their ownership of that watch. You know, one thing that people ask me all the time is, you know, does this work with identity management systems? And the whole purpose of this was to really be able to, to work with, um, you know, the, the, uh, the burgeoning world of this, uh, decentralized identity uh, and all of the things uh, like verifiable claims that we've been working on, you know, for a very long time. Uh, currently, it works with, um, you know, almost all of the, 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 the usual suspects. So if you want to tie this to your, your Microsoft identifier, your Google identifier, your Facebook identifier, we can tie to all of those, all of those kind of things. Um, so that authenticator app, as it mentions here, is the one that's designed to read the QDX dot signatures. We use the DAML smart contract platform to be able to integrate with all of those other kinds of blockchain and, and other platforms that uh, we want to do, as well as things like the ERP systems that we work with, such as SAP. Uh, and then we depend on the Hyperledger Sawtooth platform uh, to manage all of our uh, distributed ledger functions, including our audit functions, all those kind of things. 
Currently, we, we deploy on Microsoft Azure. We also have a uh, FedRAMP certified uh, hardware platform that we're going to be deploying this year. Uh, and uh, we, we can deploy, you know, on other uh, uh, things that are supported by our partners, blockchain technology, such as AWS, uh, although we haven't, uh, we haven't actually done an AWS uh, deployment uh, yet. So next slide. So I'm going to actually hand this over to uh, my partner in crime today, uh, Duncan, to uh, talk about these things because he lives every day with our digital asset friends. So Duncan, you want to take over? Thank you very much, Jay. Um, and uh, yes, I, I think you know what what's fascinating is is the way this stack has been built up and uh, the fact that you're able to use uh, both DAML, which is a smart contract language, and also drop down into into Hyperledger Sawtooth. So uh, so in terms of DAML, uh, DAML is, and we're huge fans of DAML, by the way, so I have to declare an interest here. Uh, we've been working with Digital Asset for uh, over a year now. Um, but they've open sourced uh, a smart contract platform that's really geared towards enterprise and enterprise use cases. For example, anywhere you have a multi-party uh, uh, scenario or application. Um, uh, one of the really strong features is you really do focus just on the business logic. So, uh, so the, the, we'll, we'll, at the end, we'll give you a reference to go, go look into DAMO in more detail. But essentially, you're focusing just on the business logic. So all the sort of paraphernalia that, that comes with a lot of programming languages just drops away. Um, it's built ground up to handle distributed applications. It's actually built on, on Haskell, so its antecedents are very, very strong, very strong computer science. Um, and, and this is really the key point, uh, DAML apps are portable, so you're not locked into a given platform. So at this point, uh, what Jay is doing is working very closely with us uh, with a, a ledger backed by Hyperledger Sawtooth, but if, if at some point in the future, a new technology comes along, um, so uh, it, it is possible to move or migrate those applications. Now, of course, the data is another matter, and digital assets are working uh, to provide a set of tools that will enable you to, to migrate data as well as, as the applications. And then finally, and this is a little bit in the future, but um, digital assets are working on making, uh, making these DAML contracts interoperable across spanning multiple uh, blockchains uh, or distributed ledgers, uh, and even going beyond digital ledgers, um, uh, distributed ledgers, I'm sorry, uh, looking at centralized ledgers like Amazon QLDB. So whilst that's in the future, it's great to know that this, this uh, smart contract language is future proof. So as I say, that uh, is running on Hyperledger Sawtooth. Um, uh, so Hyperledger Sawtooth. So uh, it's important to understand that this is not a standalone project. It's one of a number of distributed ledger um, uh, uh, technology or platforms that are available through the Hyperledger Foundation. So Hyperledger is in many ways a mini-me version of Apache Software Foundation. And in fact, some of the same people that started the Apache Software Foundation all those years ago are in fact involved in Hyperledger. Notably, Brian Bellendorf, uh, our executive director, uh, was one of the founders of Apache back in the day. What that means is that you have a very strong framework uh, to govern the open source project. And, and this is incredibly important. If you're gonna bet on a platform or, or a set of technologies, you want to make sure that they're open, that they're not open to abuse, they are open source and, and of course, uh, widely, uh, widely supported. Um, in the case of Sawtooth, uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to call out uh, that we like about it. And by the way, we also uh, see, see some, a lot of value in Hyperledger Bezu, which is another of the, uh, of the DLT technologies under the Hyperledger umbrella. But the first thing is that it is highly scalable and very modular. That means you can start small and you can grow and scale out as you need to. Um, there is a very clear separation between what's happening at the network layer. So this is managing the actual, uh, the blockchain, the Merkle tree, the state essentially of, of the world uh, and the application layers that sit above that. And then of course, in the context of DAML, it has first class support support for smart contract languages. And finally, and this is something again, talking about being future-proof, the same as DAMO is future-proof, uh, the ability to plug in alternate or novel consensus mechanisms as they become available is very interesting to us. So it's a very flexible, very modular framework to work with. So at that point, uh, we should be done, surely. 
So what exactly is the elephant in the room? So we've told you a great story, sounds fantastic. Well, the elephant in the room is really this. Uh, the blockchain technologies that we're working with are complex fundamentally. While we've ticked the box in terms of them being open, so we're working closely with the Linux Foundation um, uh, as well as, uh, and within, within that, not just Hyperledger, but the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and so on and so forth. But the other, the last two points are, are really, really important to, 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 to focus on for a minute. The blockchain networks themselves will be long lived and therefore they will need to be maintained. So we're building out networks that essentially uh, are going to run for, for you know, many, many years and will need to be upgraded over time. You, it's not something you can turn on and off, but it's something you will need to be able to manage and, 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 and develop. So a couple of things that we've done. First of all, we've actually teamed up with digital assets. So it's great having this concept of DAML and this concept of Hyperledger and indeed other underlying ledger technologies. But it's important to actually create a commercially supported offering. And so we and digital asset have partnered and are working together, supporting J and supporting QMC in order that they get support, not just for the platform, but also for DAML itself. So that was announced um, uh, just about a year ago, actually, at uh, Synchronized New York and um, was uh, made a fully available uh, last summer. And we've been working with customers ever since. So uh, in terms of the value we bring, so there's a couple of things. So when we say commercially supported, what do we really mean at the end of the day? Well, if I'm an enterprise, what I actually need is long-term support for an open source project. I don't want to deal with the project and the ins and outs and the politics and all of that. What I want is a stable managed distribution. This is a term that's uh, well understood in, in the world of, for example, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It's a stable distribution of an open source project, Fedora in that case. But the key here is to build, test and maintain that, provide long-term support. And in the context of our work with DA, also ensure that it implements a DAM or ledger on the back end. So again, ensuring portability, we need to present, uh, regardless of what the, uh, the DAM or ledger, how the DAM or ledger uh, backend is implemented, we need to be able to present the same, uh, the same interface for any DAML developer. So essentially they can use the DAML assistant, which is a command line tool and deploy to, to us or deploy to VMware's blockchain, which also supports uh, DAML, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the distribution. So that gives enterprises something stable to work with. They know will be supported you know, over the long term. However, coupled with that is then the tools uh, uh, and this is where Sextant comes in. It's a software product that actually takes care of all of the housekeeping, all of the, the, the heavy lifting around deploying and managing on an ongoing basis, uh, the, the smart contract and, and distributed ledger infrastructure. And in this case, smart contract, we're talking about DAML. And in case distributed ledger, we're talking about sorties, but we also, as I mentioned, support Hyperledger Bezu uh, and in the uh, non-DLT space, uh, Amazon QLDB and also Amazon Aurora. And we standardized from the earliest uh, on Kubernetes as the runtime environment. So, you know, to try and minimize the moving parts and also to ensure that there is, uh, there is you give the customers the most flexibility, Kubernetes gives you that because as Jay was saying, today he's running on Microsoft Azure. So we're actually uh, operating that service for them using the Azure Kubernetes service, but we routinely run on the, uh, uh, on the AWS Kubernetes um, service, as well as uh, Google. And of course, Kubernetes itself is available on-premise. So you have complete flexibility. So we're not locking you in to a cloud or to a specific uh, 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 underlying uh, hardware uh, stack. We're saying, no, we're gonna work with Kubernetes. Uh, it's now ubiquitous. And of course, Kubernetes itself was contributed by Google to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So strong provenance and strong uh, antecedents there. So graphically, um, what we have here is, a, is, a, is a, like a generalization of the stack that, um, that Jay was talking about, his QDX platform stack. Uh, so what he's doing or able to do is, is deploy demo applications that will actually model business processes and also, uh, as you mentioned, also drop down into sports mode, so to speak, and use Hyperledger Sawtooth natively where he wants to, and then run all of that on Kubernetes and in his case on Azure. So what are we doing? We're, we're really providing the management that coordinates all of those 
uh, all of those components in the stack. So the QDX stack is a fantastic example of how someone architects a solution following this, this model. Uh, and then what we do, of course, is then provide the, the, the support uh, in production with very hard and fast service level agreements. So everything you would expect from an enterprise. So in short, or in summary, um, we have worked closely with QMC now for the past uh, half year, uh, helping them develop an anti-counterfeit solution that's built on DAML and of course delivered by us. Um, one final thing, and this is a plug for, for our approach, our perspective, uh, uh, or rather an industry uh, analyst perspective is that we have a very clear value proposition. So what we're doing is, is enabling you as an enterprise, as an innovator to build cool stuff on top of a very stable, well-maintained and long-term supported platform. And uh, Chilla was kind of say we have the leadership team, i.e. the gray hairs uh, necessary to, 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 to deliver this. Um, and that's because Kevin and myself who co-founded uh, BTP have decades of experience wrestling with automation operations and cloud and making sure that you know, production grade uh, services are delivered. So finally, some reading, um, and these slides will be available uh, right after this call or, or webinar. So there's a link to Sextant uh, for DAML. Most importantly, in terms of this conversation, there is a link to DAML itself, so DAML.com, easy to remember. And then a couple, of, uh, a couple of other links, a case study on QMC, and I'll work with them, and I'll work with them in conjunction with Digital Asset. And then, uh, and then a, a recent announcement we put out uh, along with Digital Asset at uh, the Hyperledger Global Forum a few weeks ago. Sadly, the last, uh, and probably the last for a long while, event that uh, we'll be able to attend and sponsor in person. But uh, there's, there's that there. And then finally, before we go to Q&A, just a quick mention that uh, there's a blog post that we published yesterday that pulls together uh, a couple of threads, a couple of key threads in the sort of COVID-19 response. One is the QMC uh, uh, work that's going on. The other is, uh, is CCI from the Evanen uh, folks and, and they're putting together a consortium. And the whole idea here is that DLT, the Shooter Ledger Technology, is ultimately your passport to work. So with that, Sophia, back to you uh, to um, handle the Q&A, please. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have had a few questions comes in, come in, and uh, just, to, just to touch on uh, Sextant for DAML, is, is this something that can be used um, across a wide range of use cases and industries? For sure, yeah. I mean, you know, our job, as we see it, uh, is to ensure that we provide a platform that is both industry uh, agnostic and to a large degree technology agnostic. Although we started with Hyperledger Sawtooth, We've now added support for Bezu as well as a couple of the Amazon uh, pro products. Um, and so in many ways, we're supporting the digital asset DAML on X, where X is, uh, can be uh, any backing uh, persistence layer that supports uh, the, the, DA, um, the DA ledger, essentially. So, so yes, industry agnostic, absolutely. Um, we are, as I said earlier in, in the presentation, we do mandate the use of Kubernetes. Um, but we don't think that's a big ask these days because it's widely available and also widely understood by enterprise. But it's important to have that, you know, that stability up and down the stack. So, so that's the only real constraint that we would place on people. Absolutely, thank you. We had a question come in about um, whether or not this, uh, the counterfeiting use case that you all uh, spoke on during your presentation has been launched or when uh, it will be deployed. So um, I can't comment on some of them, obviously, because anti-counterfeiting, people like to, you know, keep that secret, right? Because uh, if you told everybody that you were implementing an anti-counterfeiting solution, people immediately try to get around those things. Um, we do have uh, at least one uh, POC that will become public uh, when it's done because uh, it actually is uh, a combined solution with some other other vendor products and things like that. Um, we'd be happy to uh, under NDA talk to anybody about it. Uh, you can reach out to myself uh, or you know come in through our website uh, and register, and we'd be happy to talk about what we're doing with our customers. Excellent. Um, in terms of sort of future applications and capabilities you have in mind for this platform, 
uh, will we at one point see a way for maybe consumers to register their products or um, perhaps there will be incentive programs for registering your products and tying that back to an individual um, in their ownership of said good? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're working with, with uh, retailers, particularly luxury retailers, who actually want people to be able to say, you know, hey, let me show you that I real, this is a real product, right? This is a real purse. This is a real watch. This is a real, you know, um, golf club for example. I mean, it's amazing the things people bring to us to, to think about these kinds of things. I mean, um, so the other way is actually another consumer uh, facing part of this is that, for example, you may not know this, but one of the things that get counterfeited a lot are brake pads. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a, there's a liability issue with uh, using non, uh, you know, OEM or certified uh, brake pads uh, in your vehicle and things like that. Same, similar to the oil case I was telling you before. So as a consumer, you want to be able to, you know, validate that what's being installed in your vehicle is a certified part. Uh, and so there are initiatives where we're working around, you know, how do we do that? Obviously also in things like food service or in uh, other areas like um, seeds, believe it or not. Um, some seeds in different industries are very expensive because they're genetically modified seeds that are designed for a specific purpose. And they can be 40, 50, $75, you know, for an individual uh, seed. And so um, we're working with, with folks to develop a coating that can be used to actually validate you know, those seeds uh, as they're grown. There've been a lot of questions that I've tried to answer a couple in the text around, you know, um, are these safe or non-toxic and those kind of things. And so there's a lot of work being done um, with different materials to find the right kinds of materials that can, can have, um, you know, uh, FDA approval, you know, when those things get to market. Obviously those are long time periods to get through through FDA approval for things as you can imagine. So uh, so we've been, we've been working with some vendors for almost a year now trying to work through uh, some of those issues so that we can we can deliver those into the consumer world. Um, so, okay, I'm just going to answer a few of these that are flowing in through uh, Q&A here real quick. So uh, sure. uh, the, the technology is already in commercialization. Uh, from our perspective, obviously, all of Duncan and VTP's things are out in commercialization. And mm -hmm. in a second, I'll let him talk about, you know, his customers and things. Um, there's a whole lot of work around the, there's a question about, uh, is it possible to tag a person using government ID? I'll again talk about more about this next week. You can read our press release on things like that. We actually use uh, driver's license passports and things like that to, to establish identity for, uh, for our COVID-19 product, which we'll talk about next week. Um, and then, um, yeah, I just so there's, there's that, a lot. Jay, the Everton, on, yeah, sure, sorry, go ahead. Just, just on that point. Um, uh, there's there's a there's a whole movement around uh, self sovereign identity and and tools uh, self sovereign SSI tools essentially which which give you control over who can see what so this is not a free for all the, you know there is uh, the ability of you to control uh, uh, on what terms for what period etc that that information can be provided um, so and going back to the earlier point about um, uh, luxury goods. Um, I know obviously it's not just applying to luxury goods, but uh, when we were at the uh, Blockchain uh, Congress in Geneva, of course, Switzerland, home of Swiss watches, etc. cetera, um, what was interesting was people were still uh, touting as a solution uh, a, a card. So a card, this is not one of them, but with, with some kind of ID on it. Um, the really cool thing about the, 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 the QX, QDX uh, dots is you can actually... Uh, put this into the actual physical object itself. So it's not about having a certificate, it's actually having the object itself tied into uh, the physical object into the digital world. So I think that's important to understand. Yeah, and, and we do that through a lot of different ways. I mean, one of the ways, you know, fascinating enough, somebody asked about liquids and ink and things like mm -hmm. that. You know, the picture that you see up here, I'm still practicing on where my where my thing is, uh, actually ties to, to what's called our QDX key card. And that card actually uses quantum dots to actually make that picture that's on the card. And that signature I was talking about is embedded into that facial image that's actually in the card there in the inking process that, uh, that creates uh, the particular card. So you get both a digital representation and a physical representation uh, of that card that's secured by the, the QDX platform technology. So. And Jay, just to add to the point about um, being able to ingest or uh, have these quantum dots inserted under the epidermis for say um, vaccines, 
what kind of um, level or what kind of what is the need for education at the consumer level to make people comfortable with this um, you know, when we reach that point? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Unknown, I think, is the answer to that. I mean, one of, one of the challenges, I think, is and the reason everybody always asks this, you know, can I drink this? Can I eat this? We're very we're physical, right? We're organic beings. We eat and drink and we do things we touch, we feel, you know, and to me, that's that's one of our biggest challenges if we live and work in the in the digital environment. I mean, I've been building software, you know, my whole life, uh, pretty much. And since I was 10. And so, so, you know, um, living in that intellectual world is one thing and living in that that digital world that we've created. I mean, look at the space around me. This is, you know, my beautiful library I'm sitting in here when uh, I can assure you behind me is not a beautiful library. Um, you know, we have that desire for that physicality of things. And so we're going to have to figure out how to adapt. How do we adapt to that? How do we how do we how do we make our world that way? And obviously, this environment that we're all in today, when we're we're literally all trapped at home and can't touch anyone else or even breathe near anyone else, uh, is contributing to the stress of how are we going to exist, you know, in that post, you know, viral world, um, you know, where where we want to interact with each other, but we need to be protected when we interact with each other. We need to know the state of the other person. We need to know, you know, whether or not they have antibodies, whether or not they pass things. We need to know whether this product, right, has been, you know, disinfected. Does this product carry it? How long could it carry it for? Uh, how do we detect that? How do we know about that? I mean, all those questions are things we're currently exploring, and um, I, I don't, I don't think we know the answers to that yet. We're, we're, we're living in an evolving world. Yeah, I think we're talking about two technologies, you know, blockchain and these quantum dots that are relatively nascent, and people, um, consumers are mm -hmm. beginning to understand it, and also businesses. So, Duncan, when um, folks are looking to implement sort of blockchain technology for different use cases, mm -hmm. what are some of the kind of challenges that they have to overcome and how does Sextant for Demo kind of give them the confidence to utilize blockchain? So increasingly what we're finding is, uh, and of course you can go try Sextant, the sorties and Sextant for Demo uh, on AWS through the marketplace, but increasingly what we're doing is we're setting people up within like 60 minutes max. And that's probably because I'm, you know, faffing around doing something or whatever, but, uh, you know, flossing my teeth or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, within 60 minutes max, we can get somebody set up with an environment, um, provided they sign an NDA. That's the only thing we ask is, you know, we don't want people to sort of waltz off into the distance with, you know, high value software. But if, if they're prepared to sign an NDA with us, we can set them up with a platform. Because one of the things I think is important is if you're going to develop, you're going to use things like DAMO. These are very high value productive tools, but they're only as productive as the platform they're running on. So, so from our point of view, uh, and we're doing this literally every, every day now, is set people up with an environment that they can then play with. Uh, there's no cost for doing that unless they're running on a cloud, in which case clearly we're not funding their infrastructure costs. Uh, but nonetheless, it's really about giving people a stable environment in which to experiment. Um, in the case of Damo, well, there are a couple of other ways you can do that. There is an SDK, which is now 1.0. Uh, so that's a you know, drum roll, big deal for, for digital asset and for all of us working with them. Very big, very big milestone. Absolutely. So well, um, one of the things, Duncan, you know, I don't think uh, a lot of people ask questions about where we are. When are we going to yeah, be in the market? Yeah. How do we do this? Which yeah. customers? You know, I, I think everybody needs to understand that that, you know, most of the things we're working on are less than 24 months old. And even the software platforms that we're building on, even Kubernetes, even, even you know, everything that we're doing around the blockchain, around DAML and those things. It was literally last week that DAML became version 1.0. So, so many of the, the POCs and the technologies and the people we work with, we've been working on them leading towards getting a, a stable certified platform to be able to deliver these at the enterprise level. We're ahead of the curve. That's what we're doing. We, we lead, you know, out there to figure out how to do these things, which gives us a strategic advantage and gives our customers a strategic mm -hmm. advantage in their business. And so as these platforms are stabilizing and becoming version 1.0 and things like that, and we're getting through certification processes with our quantum dot technology and things like that, then we'll be rolling those out to, to people. Most of our customers are large scale enterprises. We're not going to be rolling this out to five, 10, 15, 20 people. We're going to be dealing with people in the, in the thousands, tens of thousands, you know, up to millions. And so we, we have to spend a lot of time testing uh, these kind of things to make sure that they're, that they're right. We don't, we don't want anything to, uh, to fail when we roll these out. 
So. Yeah, I mean, it's a terrible pun, but you're only as strong as the weakest link in your, in this case, platform, not chain. But, uh, but the idea here is, is, you know, we want to enable people to innovate and that's what QMC clearly are doing. And it is all about providing that stable environment. And we're also thinking ahead because there are a lot of non-functional requirements that you need to think about if you're going to roll something out at scale in production with service level agreements to match. And so, again, this is all about the discipline of ensuring that uh, you don't say, oh, lastminute.com, now I need to add in security. Nobody thinks like that. It's the same with the platform itself. You don't want to be suddenly, okay, I'm about to you know, launch this thing. Now I've got to switch to a different way of delivery. So you know, our view is you know, we should be there along that journey from you know, very early inception, POC, right the way through into production and beyond. Um, and to make that easy, as I say, NDA will set you up in, in an hour or so and then support you via Slack if you're happy with that. And there's no charge for doing that. We just want the feedback. So all we ask is feedback at that early stage. And uh, we certainly had that from Jay and his team. Bailey. So, uh, so just a few questions in the thing over here that maybe I can answer a few of these. Um, there are questions, you know, um, about, you know, uh, when we apply dots in the seed world, you know, what happens next? Do we also keep them in the fiber? Are they traceable further on? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, you know, there, there are lots of things. I mean, we're thinking about track and trace. We are thinking beyond the seed. You know, the question is where in the life cycle does that come in? You know, um, you know, tracking seeds is one thing. Tracking growth is another. Tracking them in a final, you know, textile, you know, is even different. So, so there are a lot of different kinds of tracking uh, that goes on there. Um, I thought there was a couple other really good questions here. Unfortunately, I can't get to every single one that's coming through, but, but um, are we working with law printing, enforcement? That's one I yeah. thought was pretty I'm gonna interesting. Do the, yeah, I'm going to do three here so because we only got a couple of minutes. So, so one, law enforcement. Obviously, any counterfeiting implies law enforcement, right? So, so yes is the answer to that question. Um, you know, do they understand? <laughs> you know, uh, they, they want to catch, they want to catch bad guys. So they're, they're good at using technology to help, uh, catch bad guys, same, same with insurance companies. Um, the 3D printing one, um, we do not need to sell our own printers. We can actually embed uh, the dots in the actual polymers and things that the printers are using. Um, there are a lot of, uh, let's call it other challenges around how we read those uh, and how, um, you know, what we do with the dots in those different polymers. So we have several different, uh, several different uh, manufacturers of those polymers, you know, that, uh, that we're experimenting with to see what the right way to do those things. And remember, we're also building new business models uh, around these things. And so, <laughs> you know, people don't understand how we're going to price that, how are we going to do it? How are we going to handle it transactionally? So there are a lot of discussions and I'm sure people on the, on the, on the session here have ideas and we'd love to uh, love to chat with you guys about those. Um, you know, we're we we are interested in being kind of the back end, and we're looking for people with domain expertise, looking for for teams and companies that uh, we can partner with, just like we partner with BTP um, to be able to deliver things. So we're happy to uh, happy to talk to the to to, almost, to anyone. So uh, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes to the ADA <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Excellent. And we had a, we, I'll just uh, say that we had someone ask uh, whether you need to sign an NDA to make plastic parts for my business. Um, but I'd like to thank you, Duncan and Jay, for this uh, very exciting presentation. And I think we have plenty more questions from the audience and others. So I encourage everyone to visit QMC and blockchain technology partners online um, to learn about what they're doing. And um, I'll just say that both companies have um, many more announcements in the pipeline, um, as we've seen with your recent announcement about the health ID passport. So um, thank you to both of you. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, we host these bi-weekly. So next, uh, in, sorry, on April 30th at 9.15, we'll have one with Suramitsu on Project Bakong, which is their collaboration with the National Bank of Cambodia to create Cambodia's mm -hmm. only integrated payment system. Um, and we will be hosting a webinar tomorrow uh, focused on the state of the United States healthcare system and the role of blockchain in bringing citizen-owned data to, to our system. Um, as I said, you can follow GBBC on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, as well as blockchain technology partners. They post some excellent uh, resources on Medium as well.
Uh, thank you very much. And for additional questions, please reach out to us at media at gbbcouncil.org. Thank, thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye now.